Instead of looking at the lectionary readings for the seventh Sunday of Easter, what I'd like to do is consider the readings for the observance of the ascension of the Lord. Following Acts 1-3, after his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them for 40 days, speaking about the kingdom of God. The Feast of the Ascension is observed 40 days after Easter in light of this verse. The reading for this year's Ascension service are taken from Acts 1, 1 through 11, Psalm 47, Ephesians 1, 15 through 23, and Luke 24 through 53. Two videos ago, I said I would try and concentrate on Luke's gospel for the videos for this summer, since that's where most of the gospel readings are taken from in this year's lectionary cycle. But I want to take a slightly different tack on it today, yet it's still sort of the same. To understand the context of Luke 24, 44 through 53, we need to back up in chapter 24 to verses 13 through 35. Here you have the story of Jesus' appearance to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. These guys return back to Jerusalem and report their experience to the other disciples. In 24, 36 through 53, Jesus then appears to his disciples in Jerusalem, which absolutely terrified them. They thought he was a ghost. The Greek word there is pneuma, where we get the word spirit, but here the Revised Standard Version translated as ghost. Jesus attempted to address their fears by having them touch and look at him. Not sure that this would have helped me much in that situation, but that's what they tried. They still can't get their head around this, so Jesus asked them for something to eat, and he ate some broiled fish right there in front of them to prove that he really was resurrected. Then we come to the text that we have for this week, 24, verse 44 through 53. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. Now, as I was preparing my notes and doing research for this video, something puzzled me. Why is Luke 24 the last reading for the Ascension service, especially since Acts chapter 1 was the first reading for this service? Shouldn't we read Luke first and then Acts last, since Luke comes before the book of Acts in the New Testament? And doesn't Luke's reading lead us into the reading for the book of Acts? Why are these readings from Luke and Acts reversed? This got me thinking even more. If Luke and Acts were originally written as one literary work, why do we separate them in the New Testament? Here we have the ending of Luke, then we get the Gospel of John stuck right in the middle between the two. Why do we separate them like this? Somewhere in the history of the church, Luke and Acts were separated from each other. When did this happen and why did it happen? To answer these questions, we need to understand a little bit about the debates in the early church about which books should be included or not in the New Testament, and how the New Testament was to be organized. Now these are really two separate historical processes, but it's the joint result between the two of these questions that we're interested in today. First, why weren't Luke and Acts just written as one book in the first place? Well, it has to do with papyrus and scrolls. Papyrus is made from crushing reeds that are found along the rivers into thin strips and then pressing them together. And in the process of crushing them, the starches within the reed come out and when it dries, that acts as glue to hold them together. My grandkids and I ordered a kit for making papyrus 
and I'll have the link to that underneath here, and I'll have a link to the video on us making papyrus up over here. Now this is an easy exercise that anyone can do, and I would highly recommend it. It'll give you a hands-on type of knowledge and experience about how they made papyrus, what it felt like, and some idea about what it was like to write, write on those. But I digress. Papyrus as a medium is not very flexible, and it can easily fall apart if not taken care of or handled correctly. The other thing to realize is that when they made papyrus, they didn't make it in eight and a half by 11 sheets like this. Rather, they made it in long scrolls. They would take about 20 sheets, lay them out side by side, and then press them together, and the starches within it would glue this together. The length of a scroll was determined by how long the text was that was being written. For example, the letter to the Ephesians might take up 10 to 15 of these panels that would be within that scroll. You would copy it out, that might be, let's say, four feet long, and then when you were done writing it at the end, you would take your scissors and cut it off at that point. This is why they were always able to have exactly the right length of scroll for whatever they wrote. The second factor that determined the length of a papyrus scroll was the papyrus itself. If you made a scroll too long, it would become unmanageable. The longer you made it, the more it weighed and the more stress it placed upon this delicate material. The longest Greek scrolls that we know of was about 36 feet long, but that was an exceptionally well-made scroll. 20 pounds were about 10 feet in length, seems to be the common length that was sold in marketplaces. This is one of the reasons why Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all about the same length. They wanted to stay within one papyrus scroll. It also explains why Luke and Acts were originally two separate works. They were two scrolls about equal length. Even today, our books are limited or constrained by what paper can hold. If you want to have that masterpiece that you've been working on since you were 13 years old published, you'd contact the publishing house. The publisher would then give you their guidelines, which would include a page length for your work. Why? Well, just like the scribes working with papyrus, they have to work with paper. And if the book is too long, then the binding or the spine of that book will become too weak and it will begin to fall apart. When I was doing my PhD, my supervisor, Anthony Thistleton, was writing this commentary on 1 Corinthians. The final version in print here is 1,446 pages long. But I think his first submission was about 1,000 pages longer than that. Erdman's, the publisher, looked it over and said they couldn't publish a book that thick. I think they were hoping he would be able to cut it down to around 800 pages. After a great deal of picking over the details, Thistleton resubmitted it, but he had only cut it down to 1,400 pages. Or as he put it, I can't find another word in here that I can cut. In the end, they had to use extra thin paper to make it fit within a one volume work. Now this is a long way of saying that I think Luke's scribe and him were probably arguing about how long the length of Luke and Acts were gonna be. And I think in the end, they arrived at a compromise and cut the book into two parts or two scrolls of equal length. This doesn't answer the question of why Luke and Acts are separated in the New Testament. Well, once the church decided which books were recognized as part of the New Testament canon, the question then became one of order. It wasn't officially debated, but you see it within the various manuscripts that we have preserved today. Originally, because the New Testament was written on individual scrolls, the first collections were most likely a collection of a couple scrolls, let's say Matthew and Luke, or maybe a couple of Paul's letters. And while the scribes were copying the scrolls of the New Testament, a new technology was coming on the scene. Instead of scrolls, the guys at Apple HQ were working on the I papyrus. That's right, a small collection of individual sheets of papyrus that were not glued together into one scroll, but stitched along one side so that now you could create a codex. Sometimes a sheet of leather or wood was stitched onto the front or the back to kind of protect the contents. 
And just for some fun, Ikea did a great, very humorous video on the power of the book book, which is well worth looking at. And I'll have the link to that underneath here as well. Some of the first codices were collections of Paul's letters. This took place around 100 to 200 AD. Here I've got a picture of Codex Washingtonius, which is an early collection of the four gospels. And these are the wood covers with wax paint on the outside. A codex was smaller and more portable than a scroll. This was especially important during times of persecution. It was easier to transport and hide one of these from the officials. As time progressed, the codex quickly became the dominant form in the New Testament. This is why we read books today, not scrolls. But it's funny that scrolling has now come back with smartphones, tablets, and computers. Using the codex as the form for the New Testament raised a new set of questions. If we're going to put a number of different books together and letters into one codex, what order should they be put in? Remember, with scrolls, you just had a pile of them, and so order wasn't important. But now, once you put them into a codex and you have one page in front of the other, order becomes important. Over time, a number of different principles developed. The first was is that the gospel should come first. For theological reasons, you just got to start with Jesus. What about the rest of the New Testament? Well, the general principles there was to arrange it by either author or longest to shortest, or a combination of the two. So, for example, in some ancient manuscripts, after the Gospel of John, instead of the book of Acts, you have the letter to the Hebrews because it's so long. Now, there was a debate as to whether Paul wrote Hebrews or not, and that debate is still going on to this day. By moving Hebrews to the end of Paul's letters, sort of a compromise was reached. If you think it was written by Paul, well, it just comes at the end of his letters. If you think someone else wrote it, then it starts a new section with the letters of Peter, James, and John. Athanasius, who was the bishop in Alexandria, Egypt during the 300s, provides us with the earliest list of the New Testament books. In a letter that he wrote to his churches for Easter in 367 AD, he lists the same 27 books that we have in the New Testament today, but in a different order. His list starts with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then the Acts of the Apostles. After this, he then has the seven letters of James, Peter, John, and Jude. After that, we have Paul's letters with Hebrews stuck in the middle of them. And finally, he includes the book of Revelation. Many of the early codices take the book of Acts, and instead of having it after the Gospels, they slot it way back here at the end, right before the book of Revelation if they include the Revelation, which many did not. Acts most likely found its current position after John because it serves as a nice transition from the Gospels into a short history of the church before moving into the epistles. Once the church was recognized as an official religion in the Roman Empire by Emperor Constantine in 313 AD, they could afford to copy the New Testament in a much more professional manner. They no longer had to do it in dark back rooms away from the prying eyes of the Roman officials. In 331 AD, Constantine went even further. He commissioned Eusebius, who's well known for his early history of the church, to produce 50 Bibles for the churches around Constantinople. Eusebius's Bibles most likely served as the basis or the model for the better known codexes, Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. About 50 years later, Jerome's Latin version, the Vulgate, became the Bible for the Western or the Latin-speaking church. In fact, it was considered the Bible for the Western church for over a thousand years. Like many others, Jerome placed Acts after all the letters just before Revelation. Between these Greek manuscripts and the Latin Vulgate, the content and the order of the New Testament was basically set. But there were still differences about the order of the books but it was pretty well settled. What really set the order of the New Testament in concrete was the invention of the printing press. Bibles were no longer copied by hand, one at a time. Now you could mass produce them, 
And as a result, the order of the books was no longer debated because you had a standard format that was being printed and available to a lot more people. Let's go back to our reading from the Gospel of Luke and see how this plays out. At the very end of this week's reading, in 2446, Jesus says to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Luke leaves us there with the disciples being told to remain in Jerusalem until they receive power on high and that they are to proclaim Christ's name to all nations. Now notice how the first chapter of Acts, the first 11 verses for our reading this week, serve as a connection between the ending of Luke's and the start of the book of Acts. Because of the length of this video, I don't have time to read Acts chapter 1, but if you turn there, you can see what I'm talking about. In Acts chapter 1, verses 2 through 5, Luke basically summarizes the reading that we had at the end of Luke's gospel. Jesus is taken up into heaven, and he gave many convincing signs and proofs before he did. And he commanded his disciples to wait in Jerusalem. And then, like a well-trained classical author, Luke opens his book with a question. In verse 6, the disciples ask, Lord, is at this time when you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? This sets the stage for Jesus' reply. It's not for you to know the time or the period that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. These verses then set the stage for the entire outline of the book of Acts in a certain way. It starts with the disciples in Jerusalem, it moves out to Judea and Samaria, and then finally you have Paul going almost to the ends of the earth, or what they thought it was at that time, to Rome. And this commission still resides with us today to take Jesus' message and to proclaim it to all the nations of the world. This is a challenge that Luke has left us with at the end of his gospel, and at the start of the book of Acts, something that still resides upon the church and believers to this day. Until next week, when we continue looking at the book of Luke, I will leave you with the word of peace. Peace.